Okay, I'm a dash delay to all and welcome to the virtual event of Freedom R, an online discussion hosted by the Asia Freedom Institute, a nonprofit organization that calls for democracy and religious freedom in Tibet and China. I'm Sakina Bhatt and I'm the host for today's discussion. I'd like to wish all our speakers and to our lovely live audience tuning in from across the globe a very happy Tibetan New Year. And today I'm so honored to be sharing the screen with high octane and pertinent speakers. Uh, we have Bob Fu, founding president of China Aid, who's in the plane right now. And we have Chad Bullard, chief executive officer of China Aid. Uh, Dalkin Isa, president of World Uyghur Congress. Uh, so glad to be sharing the screen with you once again, Dalkin. And uh, we have uh, Gom uh, Gompo Dundubla, uh, president of Tibetan Youth Congress. Anna Kwok, uh, ex Executive Director of Hong Kong Democracy Council. And we have uh, Kedar Okasang, uh, President of Asia Freedom Institute. Um, and uh, to get a full description of our speakers' bios is available online or on the websites of their respective organization. We have kept the introductions short so that we will have more time for the discussion. Uh, a very warm welcome to all our speakers and, to, and also to all our viewers. So the topic for today's discussion is uh, towards a free and open China, voices from the trenches. And we will be discussing on the current situation inside China under Xi Jinping's rule, uh, the situation under uh, zero COVID policy, uh, the speaker's respective organizations and their campaigns. And lastly, uh, the possibility of an alliance building of all the organizations and communities fighting for their rights uh, from the Chinese government. And we are also taking questions from the audience. So please feel free to drop your questions on the comment section below. And before we commence with the discussion, I would also like to show you a very short uh, video introducing the respective organizations of our speakers. Okay, I need uh, some help here. Uh, the host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay. Mm -hmm. China Aid is an international non-profit Christian human rights organization committed to promoting religious freedom and the rule of law in China. China Aid strives to promote religious freedom for all. For 20 years, China Aid has worked to expose human rights abuses and promote truth, justice and freedom by advocating for religious freedom in China. Hong Kong Democracy Council is a Washington, D.C.-based, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization founded in 2019 by Hong Kongers amid the pro-democracy movement. They aim to foster a coherent and collaborative diasporic community in order to enrich the global dialogue about Hong Kong's democratic development and human rights issues. The World Uyghur Congress is an international organization that represents the Uyghur people, a predominantly Muslim ethnic minority group primarily concentrated in the East Turkestan or the Uyghur region in China. The organization advocates for the rights and freedoms of the Uyghur people, including their political, economic, social and cultural rights. The Tibetan Youth Congress is an international non-governmental organization that represents the interest of young Tibetans in the struggle for their rights and freedom. Founded in 1970, it is one of the largest and most influential Tibetan organizations working for the Tibetan cause. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, I would now like to hand over the discussion to Kedorla. Kedorla, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sakina. And again, welcome to all our participants. Uh, we have uh, speakers from almost four different time zones and we have Bob Fu, the founding president of China, he literally on a plane about to take off. So uh, without wasting too much time, let me just uh, quickly explain to the viewers, like we have uh, 
three rounds of general questions for each of our, you know, uh, five participants, and then uh, uh, individual you know, <coughs> rounds of individual questions for each of the four organizations represented here uh, today. And uh, so let me let me just yeah dive straight into the questions, the general question, and that'll be for you, Bob. So as you know, Bob, last November and December, we had uh, this historic and the largest protest all across China since uh, 1989, uh, which uh, was you know, across China. And uh, it really forced uh, Xi Jinping and the Chinese government to reverse the COVID-19 policies and also make a series of uh, policy U-turns. So now that we have about two to three months of you know, distance and the opportunity to look back on it, I was wondering if you could uh, share your thoughts uh, in terms of uh, did this mass mobilization of uh, you know, uh, uh, public organizing and you know, just uh, mobilizing the public, did it really have an impact on, uh, uh, in terms of uh, Chinese society and Chinese politics? Uh, that's the first question. And then, all, then also, um, what are some of the lessons that we can, you know, take away from this? Uh, was this kind of a, like a one-off uh, mobilization or was there something more long-term and more significant? And most of all, do you feel like uh, this development uh, has in any way weakened uh, the powers of uh, Xi Jinping and uh, the Chinese Communist Party and especially in terms of how the average Chinese person on the street views Xi Jinping and the party. Uh, so over to you, Bob. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Tandor. I, it's really a privilege for me to be here with uh, you and all other um, distinguished guests and friends, uh, old friends from the community leaders from Tibet to or, uh, East Turkestan to uh, or Hong Kong uh, friends. Um, first of all, I feel, um, yes, um, for the first question about whether it's a, a encouraging sign to see the simultaneous, spontaneous, um, and kind of uh, organized, but massive uh, protest all over China, over the fed up, of the Xi Jinping's uh, rep repressive zero uh, COVID policy. And I think it is um, um, imperative uh, to encourage those who chose to rise up. Um, it's like uh, 34 years ago when I was sitting at the Tiananmen Square, those um, uh, Beijing residents, or those workers, those intellectuals all come to give us water, bread, and um, uh, as, a, as a tremendous uh, uh, solidarity with us. And uh, I think uh, that certainly is a, is a, is a good uh, uh, sparkle uh, for the uh, fire for freedom. And to answer your second question, whether that means uh, it will undermine fundamentally the uh, Xi Jinping's uh, big, uh, rule, uh, I feel, I. To, uh, state this um, that uh, Xi Jinping uh, in the past 10 years had successfully uh, transitioned China uh, from um, uh, authoritarian dictatorship to uh, essentially uh, a tyrannical uh, uh, dictatorship. I mean, the two types of dictatorship um, is very different um, because the, the former one, the authoritarian dictatorship, still try to uh, balance at least, uh, you know, the international interest to the international ad advocacy outcries versus the domestic needs, or, you know, uh, to have some fine tune of their policy accordingly, accordingly. But to the tyrannical, tyrannical uh, dictatorship, and uh, the party state only cares about uh, uh, how to keep its ruling, the ruthless ruling, uh, in power, uh, no matter what. In other words, the lives of the Chinese people or the people of Tibetans, the Uyghurs, the uh, other ethnic minorities um, uh, means nothing uh, compared to keeping the Communist Party's continuous uh, ruthless rule. So I think that explains why 
the escalation of the ethnic cleansing, the genocide against uh, on the cultural genocide against the Tibetans, uh, of course, uh, the Uyghur uh, community and uh, and uh, thousands of uh, Christian churches were being forced to shut down. And many of my pastors in prison from uh, seven years, eight years, 10 years, 13 years for simply like uh, refused to tear down the cross from the rooftop. So that is, um, I think uh, we have to explain, uh, understand the Xi Jinping's uh, nature of the party state. The third question is, um, you know, how we can do better or are, is there any uh, 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 good way we can be proud of? I think uh, from uh, the perspective of China aid, uh, we, I always think the best way to counter the repression in China, uh, the Xi Jinping's ruthless rule is uh, for our uh, number one, for our overseas community to be united. And uh, the Communist Party's uh, very effective weapon in the past 30, 40 years uh, to destroy or divide uh, the dissident uh, democracy movement is try to uh, make the, uh, uh, the, the uh, dissident communities divided uh, and, uh, or only take our own interest. So we all need to strive for like religious freedom for all, freedom for all. And, uh, uh, I remember we uh, initiated the first uh, kind of when the Uyghur, uh, the genocide started, the concentration camp was discovered. We released uh, eight um, uh, 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 editorial, I mean, uh, breaking news uh, by, I sent a reporter to Kazakhstan and documented it. And then we released it to the whole world. And then we uh, uh, grabbed together uh, with the, uh, over uh, the Uyghur American communities and uh, in, uh, to speak up in the White House, in the European Parliament, the United Nations, and even bring them uh, to the churches to raise up the voice together. Uh, so I think that's very essential. And uh, of course, also to the Communist Party in China, uh, they are also very afraid if uh, we, uh, as a community of uh, press, to be united. So let's encourage our community, our members, uh, whether it's uh, you know church member from Catholic, Protestant, or Uyghur, or Tibetan, Falun Gong, or um, you know Hong Kong friends. Let's unite it together and to make Xi Jinping feel um, as long as uh, he is uh, ignoring the life, dignity, and freedom, we will not let out. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Bob. It looks like uh, you have to leave us. Uh, looks like you're about to take off. Uh, sorry, yeah. So I have to yeah. leave. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So I want to thank you again, Bob, for joining us. I uh, really appreciate you your making time and uh, being with us this morning. So thank you again and uh, have a, have thank a safe flight. <laughs> thank you, Bob. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I apologize. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, I think what we'll do is uh, just uh, have this question, you know, just uh, be out, be answered by, you know, by the rest of the, the speakers uh, here. So maybe I'll, I'll request uh, Dolkun if you could, you know, uh, go next and kind of share, you know, share with us your thoughts on this. Sure. Uh, first, thank you very much, uh, Kelsan, who invited me for this uh, wonderful uh, webinar. Uh, is uh, you know is uh, because of this demonstration uh, and spread in China because of the uh, 24 November, as you know, uh, and the fire uh, a case was happening, and the Chinese government official um, report is 10 people died, but uh, we got the news because some of some family members staying in Turkey, some of some uh, Finland, some uh, are living still in in the Switzerland. Uh, they all uh, get different of way. Uh, we got a, come from at least 44, 44 people died in the case. Actually, this is the a case in the, the local government and the CCP uh, should talk uh, responsibility for this because, of course, is a restriction and uh, uh, implement almost for a couple of months uh, entire China, including East Turkestan as well. But is uh, is it level is big different, 
uh, actually Chinese government led the people to die at home. It is this day in the fire was happening. Uh, even in the, didn't allow them to escape. escape. If and also uh, a firekeeper also uh, coming up to two or something that like just five minutes away uh, away from the this apartment have a uh, firekeepers they are coming up to two hours so it is mean is the Chinese government just they, uh, and they, uh, let them to die so after that and the mass demonstration was happening different of uh, Chinese city uh, it is mean it is show. Uh, that there is a general dissatisfaction uh, from the people in China, uh, because almost foremost everybody is not, was not happy of the CCP uh, this uh, policy. There was sense of the solidarity from the Chinese people uh, following the fire in the Urumqi because uh, it, it, this is the, was the result of a COVID nineteen policy that was also implemented through whole China. Uh, that if not reacted, uh, same things was happening in uh, to the Chinese people in China. So that's why this most uh, demonstration has happened. Of course, this uh, this demonstration uh, after this uh, mass protest, uh, Chinese government lifted uh, most of the restriction, uh, which is uh, some way was in the response to the uh, pop, uh, uh, population uh, dissatisfaction on the pressure, so, uh, but. The Chinese government response not because of their care of the people. They are not care of the respect of the people's feeling. Because it does not, Chinese government does not and want to lose it is legitimacy and also afraid to uh, uh, spread too widely. So, however, this means that collective pressure uh, coming from the Chinese people can work to some level. And it is still important uh, to remember that Chinese people who took the street only did this the relation to pandemic restriction because the measure also infect them, entire population. But we didn't see anyone, any demonstration call out Chinese government policy against the Uyghurs or Tibet uh, and all gen genocide girl policy. This is the, uh, the, the uh, some, something we have to get listening, you know? Uh, yeah, solidarity is, must uh, include all of this issue. You know, if the people are silent on ongoing genocide, and it, it is not re really solidarity. Uh, this because the Chinese people are suffering, Tibetan people are suffering, Uyghur people are suffering, and the Hong Kong is suffering. So, so we have to solidarity each other. Not it is this mass demonstration. Not only uh, for the COVID restriction. Uh, and should be sympathized for the Uyghur people today. So uh, this is the, my, my view on this. And the, for last for your point, you mentioned it is the, uh, have this development weakened Xi and the, uh, Xi Jinping as a uh, party. I don't think uh, this uh, protest weakened uh, party or uh, Chinese Communist Party or Xi Jinping, uh, but this in fact, in fact, on the, their legitimacy and image, uh, particularly internationally. So it is already a big impact for this, uh, but uh, since then we have seen in the uh, Xi Jinping uh, the, and the uh, policy uh, the against Uyghur Tibet uh, has never changed. Continue is more than millions, more than three million people. It's still a suffering concentration camp. No one is released. Uh, yeah, this is the, my my uh, answer for this. Uh, thank you, Dokun. Uh, Anna, could you share your thoughts and analysis on the uh, recent? demonstrations in China. Yeah, sure. And um, thanks for having me and thanks for, you know, uh, having this discussion space, because I think it's really important to have different movements coming together to really talk about, you know, the many changes we have seen over the last year. And I think for the protests that happened in China, uh, honestly, in the very beginning, um, there was worries, a lot of worry, actually, in my mind that people would only think about the issue being a problem from the province officials. Because I think in the recent two decades, of course, we have seen a lot of, you know, one-off protests happening across China. And most of the time, uh, the problem is always, you know, from the province of officials, not really uh, dedicated to the root of it, which is a one-party dictatorship. And uh, this time when the protests first started, it was framed as a socioeconomic policy failure. 
and also an implementative policy failure that it was the province officials or city government that failed to put reasonable implementation to the framework of the zero COVID policy. Um, but I think the motivating part is that after you know, a round of preliminary protests, people started to think more and think outside the box uh, to realize that actually, instead of the city officials, they should be blaming or thinking about, they should actually think about the Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping, which are the roots of the problem. So that was, I think, a motivating and also kind of a groundbreaking, I think, uh, development inside of China as well. And also for the first time, I'm seeing people linking economic problems, socio, uh, social policies to political ideologies, because previously, I think it's also a trend in China that when things like this happen, uh, people would kind of categorize it into its own bucket of failures instead of thinking it to have, you know, uh, more political implications underneath. And this time people really manage um, to make that linkage. So even though, as Dokin say, said, uh, I agree that, you know, uh, the protests did not really weaken the party or Xi Jinping by any means. Um, but still, I think it's a part of the process that people manage to finally learn how to protest, how to think politically, how to uh, network among themselves, and most importantly, how to trust one another. Because I think in the Chinese uh, community, the problem is that under the authoritarian rule, uh, the party has always pit people against one another, and it has been difficult for people to trust each other and to network and to organize together. But this time at the protest, it was a practical experience for people to learn from actions and learn by actions. And that was one of the most valuable uh, outcomes of the movement, I would argue. But of course, uh, I think right now the challenge is how can the uh, Chinese community move on or uh, really heal themselves from it? Because a lot of people have been arrested and um, they are disappearing into nothingness. We don't really know where they are. So I can imagine it's really hard inside of China uh, to uh, move on and to really think about their next steps. So I think that is something that people have to power through. Um, but just one last point, uh, I understand we have to keep it brief, uh, is that I think another great outcome from this movement is that people from the international community are learning the differences between the Chinese people and the Chinese government. Because before the protests, there were always, you know, weird uh, rhetoric or narratives saying that the Chinese government is completely supported by the Chinese people, which I think is just not true. We see so many groups, for example, China AIDS group have been fighting for democracy and freedom in China for ages, and they have a lot of support, right? Um, and this time, I think after the movement and protests happened inside of China, uh, we have one more very powerful evidence to show people, to show the global community that Chinese people do not necessarily think or act the way the party wants. And uh, they also do not necessarily support the party or the dictatorship. And that is a very important distinction to make. And that also gives a very fair and a strong premise for international community, for governments around the world to act on. Thank you, Anna. Uh, and Gombala, your thoughts? Uh, Dr. Dele, and warm greetings to all the co panelists. Thank you, Asia Freedom Institute, uh, for organizing this event. Thank you, Kedola, Sakinala, and all uh, for having me here. So, yes, uh, so as mentioned by all our co panelists, this strict zero COVID policy rules were also imposed by Chinese government in Tibet. So, uh, with there, there's a scarcity of essential. Uh, Commodities and ill treatment by authorities have created a great hardship for the Tibetan inside Tibet. Many Tibetans are using the social media platform to air their frustration with the Chinese government for denying uh, basic healthcare facilities and adequate uh, meals to the people detained under the guise of COVID prevention. So many Tibetans have been reportedly detained for simply act of sharing a COVID related photos and videos online. Recent reports further indicate many Tibetans have committed suicide uh, as a result of a harsh inhuman measure uh, adopted by the Chinese zero COVID policy. There were uh, some protests in Tibetan capital Hesa against the zero COVID policy, but it was forcefully silenced by the Chinese uh, hardship, uh, by the Chinese hardship policy. So this historic 
wave of uh, mobiliz mobilization of the masses, uh, especially the Han Chinese, the Chinese people who were controlled by their own government for so long has exposed the ill treatment of their own uh, Chinese Communist government. So that we, the Tibetan and the, all the victim of this so-called People Republic of China are calling uh, this ill treatment internationally for more than six decades. Now this ill treatment and uh, this harsh policy is also proved by the Chinese citizen this time. Now the Chinese people will look more suspiciously over their own government, the CCP, and this movement has proof that deep within the Chinese people are insecure about the CCP and they have lost their faith in their leadership. So these recent protests in the Beijing not only call against the zero COVID policy, but they also raise the slogans to Xi to step down and they don't want dictatorship. So it's a proof, uh, it's a kind of simple proof that the CCP will not uh, last long. So whenever this kind of uh, the protest or the uh, campaign organized uh, campaign happened in the either in the mainland China or across, we as the victim of uh, Chinese Communist Party, we should be stand together to raise our voice against the Communist Party, and we must collaborate our campaign work to make China accountable. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gompala. So as you all. Uh very well know the current US China relation is very much in the news. Uh, for instance, uh, the US canceled uh, Secretary Blinken's planned visit to China earlier this month over the Chinese spy balloon incident. And uh, relations in general have also been negatively impacted by China's growing support for Putin and Russia over Ukraine. And uh, relations between the two in general are on a very slippery slope, as, as we all know. So the question I have for all four of you is, how does the worsening relationship between the US and China impact your work of uh, advancing human rights and freedom in China? What opportunities and challenges uh, do you see in the current geopolitical environment? So maybe we'll just have uh, Dolkun, if you could uh, you know, start off the response. Yeah, sure. <laughs> this, uh, uh, you know, China and the uh, U.S. relationship getting uh, de uh, relations getting deteriorated, and also uh, Blinken's trip is uh, uh, the cancel in this this uh, is a spy balloon incident. Is all so this uh, international community must understand how the CCP mentality work. Uh, it does not respond to soft diplomacy. Chinese government, CCP, never understands soft diplomacy because there is one thing where uh, most of you, uh, the uh, Western government doesn't understand one point. This is all government is treating China is a normal government. It is not normal government, you know. It's a dialogue. That's why we are completely and the disagree is implementing the dialogue between EU, United States. It was a human rights dialogue, of course, human rights dialogue. This human rights dialogue taking place more, more than 20 years, some countries, some countries 30 years, but human rights situation in China is in the, in the past is bad, then worse, no genocide uh, level. So that's why uh, is most of them government don't really don't know how to treat to China. So this uh, relationship getting worse, of course, give provide them some advantage because with Uyghur, Tibetan, Hong Kong, we use our experience try, trying to explain how dangerous CCP Chinese government for the dangers for uh, world peace, democracy, human rights. You know, not only uh, CCP uh, uh, threaten China, uh, just uh, Hong Kong, Tibet, Taiwan, or the East Pakistan, but also entire in the global democracy, global world, global peace. Uh, so we had a good experience. We know this government is very well. So that's why this kind of uh, it, it's a problem is US uh, we, since more than Colonel Dalai Lama continually saying this advocacy more than 60 years, all leaders saying more than 70 years since occupation, but most of them, United States or Western country, and uh, is it uh, uh, treat normal and whole China today, second big economy coming to this level, 
And big, huge, uh, and the contribution by the United States, European country, Japan, this country, because China came up with this level because of the Western money, Western technology. So this is no provide us look what we are right because we are we be talking about or, or experience this side and no it is the some more uh, people more uh, uh, government uh, institution uh, and listening to us this is good of course but and China will never respond to the international com uh, and the community uh, condemnation of the human right abuse it, it will only response tangible action, you know, such as sanction, bans, and other me measures, it will be uh, helpful. Just negotiation, no, just be sanctioned for the Chinese government. It is playing a major role. Uh, and the United States response for the balloon, uh, and the response as has been very public and uh, uh, action-oriented, uh, which is, I think, is needed. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, maybe Gompola, if you can respond. Yes, so the Chinese or oh, time and again with their influence, with their political and economic influence, try to change the international narrative, especially they are trying to dominate international community and agency with their uh, false narrative and uh, propaganda. So it's a high time for the United States and all the international community to, to take strong, concrete decisions against the so-called CCP. So we the Tibetan Youth Congress highly welcome the US timely action uh, to postpone the uh, Secretary Blinken planned trip to China earlier this month. And same time, the U.S. shooting down, uh, shooting down of Chinese uh, spy balloon has sent a clear message that the U.S. will not tolerate any spying activity that threat the national security of the United States. Therefore, as a democratic leading nation, the U.S. has the same responsibility to safeguard the democratic values and protect and support the human rights of the people around the world, especially all the victim countries of the Chinese Communist Party. So we, the Tibetan, and we are all the Uyghurs and all the Southern Mongolians and the Hong Kongers have a strong expectation to the United States, United States, and all the democratic, uh, justice-loving country to uh, support our call uh, for the freedom, our call for the justice. So this is, uh, we welcome the timely action by the United States and we still expect the more kind of concrete and the strong, uh, su stronger support uh, from the United States and all the freedom loving country. Great, uh, Anna, your perspective? Yeah, I think uh, the other speakers have uh, really brought up great points and definitely second what Dokken has said that uh, human rights dialogues are a lot of the times meaningless and really performative. And I think this time when there's the balloon incident, um, we there's a opportunity for our people and our groups uh, to really show uh, the international community that when they are freaking out over technologies used by China for uh, censorship and surveillance, we have been under that censorship and surveillance for years and even decades. So, for example, during the uh, COVID, uh, zero COVID policy that was also, you know, uh, happening in Hong Kong as well, the Hong Kong government was using an app to track, you know, you know, in, in the name of COVID, they asked all Hong Kongers to use an app to report where they are, you know, at what time with who, you know, those things. And these are just, you know, a very, very tip of the iceberg of what the Chinese uh, Communist Party is capable of. And that's why, you know, when we are seeing the balloon incident, um, I think our communities have the opportunity to really say that we are the case studies for the international community to understand the party's playbook. And that's an opportunity for us to get our cases seen and uh, get people to understand that what is happening with the Chinese Communist Party does not only matter to uh, our groups or people inside of China, but also to the international community because we have been testing grounds for ages and what have been used in our territories would be used uh, globally. So for example, look at TikTok as well. When people are thinking about the balloon, they should think about TikTok as well because TikTok is just you know an app to uh, uh, really get information and a lot of uh, uh, sensitive information information as well from Americans and uh, international community. So the balloon incident just illustrates, you know, the totalitarian expansion and really the ambition of China. 
And again, human rights, freedom, democracy have always been put into its own silo or category of discussion. And it's time for the global community to realize there should be pieces and essence of human rights in whichever topic they're talking about. Even when they're talking about the balloon incident, they should think about how that infringes human rights and privacy matters and how that relates to a bigger plan the Chinese Communist Party is waging. So that is uh, a time for our uh, organizations to act on as well, which is to together we should really push human rights topics into whatever national security issue people are talking about. Thanks, Anna. And finally, Chad, your thoughts? Uh, you need to unmute, I think. Right, perfect. Hey, thank you guys so much for, for having us in China Aid. And of course, I'm uh, new with Bob here uh, as a CEO. So I just want to say thank you guys. And it's great to, to meet all of you. Uh, my first thing is, I, my thoughts is, I was the international liaison for the United States government with uh, Homeland Security, uh, you know, studying security and, and meeting with the foreign governments. And over time, we haven't had a great relationship with China. Matter of fact, we couldn't even get into the country of China as a federal agent. And so I'm looking at it more as a, a security concern with a balloon. Um, we should have detected that very, very quickly and shot that out immediately instead of it actually scanning throughout the entire United States. So do, do I think that puts a strain on our governments? Absolutely, 100 percent. As far as that affecting China aid, I would say no. I would think actually it gives us more uh, credibility. It actually puts the spotlight on the violation of, of human rights and just spying. And so as far as the work that China Aid does, it actually brings the light of everything that's going on in that country. So for us as an organization, it may in some ways benefit us to a certain extent because of all the news media, because of everything that's going on. So I would say in hindsight, from our perspective, it really doesn't change a whole lot other than maybe just give us more uh, credibility. Uh, thanks, Chad. That was really uh, precise. And uh, so thank you all for all your responses. So to get to the, the third and the final group questions. Uh, so I mean, all of you are working, uh, your organizations and the communities that you represent, you're working on advancing freedom, democracy, and human rights in China. Uh, and this is really, I can't emphasize enough, this is uh, extremely, extremely challenging work. Uh, so if you could share just very briefly, you know, what are some of the key recent uh, development uh, and victories, both in general, as well as respective to uh, the work of your individual organizations that provide, uh, you know, some hope in your efforts to promote democracy, human rights, uh, and religious freedom in China. Uh, for example, can you share like one or two, you know, examples of uh, successful campaigns uh, legislations and actions that could serve as uh, models to push back against uh, Beijing's human rights uh, abuses and repression of religious uh, and ethnic minorities. Uh, and finally, you know, how can, and this is something which is really important to the work of the Asia Freedom Institute, how can all the organizations and communities represented here, and, as well as in general, you know, people working on in this space, how can we work more closely together and really build a stronger community? I mean, for instance, can this community uh, uh, imagine and articulate uh, a collective and a shared vision of a post-authoritarian China? So a lot to really uh, chew on and, and kind of comment, but uh, if you could yeah, just uh, really quickly comment on, on one or more aspects of this question. Maybe we'll start with uh, Anna, yeah. Sure. So um, in terms of successful campaigns and legislations, uh, so recently, uh, a few months ago, the Hong Kong government was trying to organize this global financial summit where they asked a lot of international bankers to Hong Kong to support the regime, uh, in essence. And uh, so the Hong Kong community really came together and pulled a huge campaign, you know, with reports. For example, we released a report on business not as usual in Hong Kong and how banks or uh, international corporations are just helping the government to conduct you know a lot of silencing and censorship so those efforts did come into you know a small victory that uh, a few ceos of these banks uh, did drop out in the end and of course if we talk about legislative apparatuses i think one thing to appreciate is also 
uh, when we're talking about Hong Kong, it used to be only about, you know, bills on sanctions or bills that are very directly related to the human rights scene. But right now we're seeing bills that are about removing the HEETO offices in the U.S. or uh, asking American companies, uh, helping them to act, you know, more justly and fairly in Hong Kong. So it's good that we're seeing you know, how human rights are penetrating into different industries and disciplines rather than just being our own blocks. Um, but I think, you know, other than this sort of legislative or campaign successes, I do want to talk about the more human aspect of how we are seeing more victories and positive development. Because one thing I remember uh, very vividly from the China protests that happened, uh, white paper protests that happened uh, uh, several months ago, was that there were um, some ex-patriots uh, of China, you know, they used to be really supportive of the party. They actually messaged me to apologize um, because in 2019, they were the ones that criticized the Hong Kong movement. They were the ones that did not want to recognize, uh, you know, the freedom of Hong Kong people, Uyghur people, Tibetan people. But when the protests were breaking out in China, they were able to empathize with why we fought. And I think that is actually a huge victory to see and think because uh, in that act, people were able to put empathy to use and people were able to build trust and understand why our people uh, are fighting for our right to self-determination, for example. And I think that is the kind of post, uh, uh, that is the kind of democratic China region we want to see, right? That people are respected for who they are and people are respected for their right to self-determination. So I think when we are talking about moving on as this greater coalition of movements, uh, it's good to have uh, that you know kind of empathy in place. And it's good that in the future, I think perhaps we can talk about uh, joint campaigns or joint movements that really get people's attention on right to self-determination and how we can also collectively use uh, different legislative policies to come together and to counter the Chinese Communist Party when they're trying to expand authoritarianity and how they're trying to uh, really uh, put an end to a lot of the democracies we're seeing around the world. Oh, thanks, Anna. Dolkun, your response? Yes, so yeah, we are also continue uh, doing our advocacy work. Uh, we, we can say we can uh, we can see some positive uh, response from internationally. Uh, for example, just uh, this month, beginning of this month, uh, February once, uh, I was in Canada. Uh, I had a meeting also with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Um, it, and uh, it's a several minister here and the immigration minister. So all parliament is a Canadian parliament opposition and the ruling party all unanimously, unanimously vote M62 motion. 322 parliament member all stand up and support this motion. This is motion is uh, um, uh, regarding 10,000 Uyghur refugees resettlement program. Yeah, we're working on uh, since 2018. Uh, this is the big, give us a big hope. It is a, one of big step. No, is well, we're working as together is a global affairs is Canada and the immigration minister and what we come is one of the official partner of this. We will work on next step for this. And uh, as you know, is it so far is uh, from 2020 uh, and 2022, uh, two bill uh, is approved by the U.S. Congress and uh, signed. One is a former President Trump signed. Another one is a billing, uh, uh, current President Joe Biden signed into, into the law. One is the Human Rights Policy Act. One is is uh, Uyghur, uh, Forcible Prevention Act. This is a, a, one a good step. So far, the ten national parliament recognize Uyghur genocide motion. Uh, plus U.S. government and the, plus also European Parliament. Uh, yeah, it's just recognized with genocide, but we continue uh, pushing and some other parliament, uh, national parliament recognized with genocide. And uh, just last week, uh, I was in 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 the uh, in the Geneva UN uh, CISCAR uh, Committee Economic uh, Cultural Right uh, Committee review Chinese report Tibetan Hong Kong Uyghur Chinese Democrat all together. We are joining this uh, this this review. It was very 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 uh, very good, very good cooperation we have since then here. Uh, and uh, as you know, is a budget. Uh, you, you, uh, UN High former uh, High Commissioner of the Human Rights. Uh, she published a report last minute, just ten months before she left uh, her term. 
uh, because a lot of uh, uh, advocacy work, Uyghur organization, international human rights organization, even some countries and the other way she, she really didn't want to release, but finally because of this advocacy work and the, she and the, uh, published it. And the others just uh, uh, last week was happening. Uh, you know, the Chinese government now is continue doing uh, uh, propaganda tour. Uh, Erkin Tunyas, who is the governor of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, uh, he planning to he was planning to visit Europe, UK, uh, Bruxelles, and some other country. Then after he got this, because he he, uh, he uh, is the uh, preparator, he is the uh, playing uh, playing major role on the ongoing Uyghur genocide. So and the, the old lawyer Michael Pollack uh, and apply to the persecutor if Erkin Tunyas are even to the UK, uh, he must be arrested. Because uh, he's a one of the guys who's sanctioned less of the US government, you know. Uh, and also, we are doing the same uh, advocacy work in the European uh, Union, in the Brussels. Then finally, and Erkin Tunyas' uh, trip uh, to Europe is a castle. It is a huge uh, and, uh, success. And another thing is you just uh, two days ago, last week, uh, in weekend, uh, Munich Security Conference was taking place in, in Munich, uh, more than. 650 international, all entire leaders, except Putin, except uh, and uh, Iran, and, and all countries' leaders, uh, goal, uh, minister uh, were in the Munich. Unfortunately, Wang Yi, he was here too. So we hold the press conference, World Uyghur Congress, Human Rights Watch, hold the press conferences, Munich Security Conference should not be hosting uh, and uh, Wang Yi or any Chinese leader because now it's a, a, a committee genocide. Yeah, this is uh, some some part of the advocacy, some uh, in, in fact of the advocacy work, and the how we can cooperate, the close the cooperate between communities and the NGO. This is very important. We have uh, more or less all common goal. You know, Tibetan Uyghurs and uh, we all have semi common goal. So we share resource and the expertise. Yeah, and uh, because and the all document we can share each other and work on one common project. Sometimes it's a com common project. Uh, it is good also, and join uh, protest action, join letter, join event. Uh, just last week, we did time to time. Last week, as I said, in the Geneva, we did very successful, learning together and learning uh, uh, best practice from each other. Yeah, but some cases, the Tibetan people have very successful, some cases, Hong Kong's people are very uh, successful, some cases, Uyghurs uh, actually they are successful. We have to share, we have to learn each other time to time and coming together. You know, and the leadership should be get, getting some workshop or, or roundtable, or three code roundtable. It's uh, very useful, and also in the uh, supporting each other and uh, and the publicly and uh, you know in the if issues presented with joint statement and also action time to time. We all the time we work in things that is better. Uh, yeah, and working together and, uh, and establish accountability mechanism. Uh, and if possible, in the mechanism uh, mechanism on China, uh, it will be is and uh, good last time in the Washington in Tibet organized one uh, eight uh, global uh, world uh, parliamentary uh, convention on China. That time also discussed a little bit for this uh, how we can, but and then it's, we stopped. We, we should do it. We have to. We have to uh, meet again. We have to uh, set up some accountable mechanism on China. Well. Yeah, this is the my view on this. Uh, thanks, Lokuna. So just very briefly, yeah, Chad and then Gombala. I, I think for us, I'll just, uh, as an organization, some of the wins that we've had recently is our Mayflower Church. We uh, relocated them. We were able to rescue them in 2019. We had uh, moved them to uh, South Korea. And then we have recently moved them to Thailand. And so we're in the process of trying to get refugee status, but we're getting some pushback. And so... Uh, with the threats and, and the different uh, basically Chinese spies in China, I'm sorry, in Thailand that were sent from China. We're currently working through that, but we are having some success with other governments too, uh, working with uh, Taiwan, working with uh, European countries. And so we're getting some movement, we're getting some traction, and um, hopefully we can set them up in this country and they'll be free. So that's kind of our goal in that right there. But we are seeing some wins in that. And uh, I love what you guys said uh, just about sharing information and working together. That is so, so, so important uh, as we all come together for human rights throughout the world. Because if we let China continue, what are we gonna have? 
we're going to have straight tyranny. And we know that Xi Jinping is actually trying to take over the world uh, as far as his leadership. So I love what you guys said. One last thing I'll mention, just 20 seconds here, is that the U.S. has started a new, it's called the, um, uh, well, it's, it's brand new. It's called the World Corps, I believe, or the Pro Corps. But what we, what it is, is basically you can come to this country if you have a sponsor and you're feeling you're, you're basically uh, having some type of persecution. And so the United States government started that. So we're currently working with them uh, as China aid to promote this, this action with the problems with the border and everything that's going on here in the U S. So thank you. Thanks, Chad. Yeah. Go below. <laughs> yes. GYC, since we are all inception, we have put uh, all the campaigns uh, to expose the Chinese atrocity as a, uh, priority and had made an immense contribution toward the Tibet uh, freedom struggle, whether it's a political campaign work or the social services uh, and education full. So politically, we were able to stand firm against the Chinese Communist government with the same voice from the beginning and keep a large portion of uh, Tibet independent. So for the question of the reason, the kind of uh, successful event that uh, after the ch Chinese COVID lockdown, we have digitally switched uh, and organize a different virtual campaign. And we are mobilizing and advocating the Tibet cause uh, virtually. And uh, meanwhile, Tibetan Youth Congress, we had uh, advocacy and interacting uh, uh, program in a different place across the globe to raise, uh, to support for the Tibet and all the uh, oppressed nation. So the sec for the second, uh, second caution for the cooperation, it's a very important and a must. We all are suffering under the same system oppressed and repressed with the same inhuman policies impl implemented one after another in all these uh, uh, colonies by the Chinese communist governments. Therefore, our cooperation will strengthen our joint movement in exposing the Chinese atrocity. Uh, so the TYC, we were able to conduct one of the successful uh, first North, uh, North America Asia Alliance conference in New York last year. So we are still looking forward to have more kind of conference and interactive session with all our common alliance. So the cooperation is must and is uh, very important. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gumpala. Thank you, everyone. So we'll now move on to the second and final uh, portion of our session, which will be jointly uh, facilitated by Sakina and myself. And so over to you, Sakina. Thank you so much, Kedullah, and thank you to all our speakers for sharing your views. And I would like to remind our speakers once again to please uh, stick to the time limit due to dearth of time. And also, I would like to remind our audience that we will be taking questions, so you can uh, leave your questions on the comment section. So my first question is to Bob. So Bob, the U.S. Um, um, U.S.-based Christian nonprofit organization Open Doors uh, publishes an annual world watch list that ranks countries based on the level of persecution uh, faced by Christians has currently ranked China as the country with the most number of reported church attacks. So what are some of the persecutions faced by the Chinese Christians under Xi Jinping's rule? And how has the CCP's uh, religious policies impacted the lives of the Christians living in China? And what steps are being taken by China Aid in this regard? Sure, Sakina, I'll take that. Bob's probably in the air right now, so I'll uh, I'll intercept that question for him. Uh, the list of persecution is pretty expansive, from cross demolitions, constant surveillance. The the surveillance system itself is so robust in China. You have two hundred thousand internet police alone that are constantly just monitoring the internet service, uh, raiding normal church gatherings, uh, harassment, arrest, imprisonment. With house churches being illegal in China, all of those who separate themselves from the state-controlled church, it's basically called the Three Self Patriotic Movement or the Catholic Association, are subject to persecution. And so meanwhile, the CCP is constantly straining official churches, making them more into a propaganda outlets than really religious organizations. And so much of Xi Jinping's rule has focused on how to minimize the house churches in China. Uh, and basically here at China Aid, we provide legal assistance to those churches, we support those families. Uh, we are hiring, we hire legal services for them to uh, educate the uh, the prisoners, the, the house church pastors that have been arrested and sometimes their congregation. And then we just offer uh, both uh, support from different informants or Christians that we have on the ground or whatever religion they are, 
or we uh, help them financially or both. So that's that's currently what we're doing. But lots of atrocities going on right now. I would say uh, we've seen the height of it in 2022. It's probably been the highest we've seen in, in many, many years. So. Thank you. So, Dolkun, uh, the suffering of uh, your people, the Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims, uh, really uh, hit the collective conscience of uh, the world and, and the international community, especially starting in 2017, right, when the Chinese government decided to set up what they call the vocational education and training centers. But, but these were really internment camps. These were concentration camps where over 1.8 million of your people were detained. Uh, so this, uh, for the first time, you know, the information leaked out and people really realized kind of the, the scale and kind of the, the depth of the, the problem and suffering that uh, Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims were kind of uh, having, <laughs> having to endure, right? So since then, I mean, you mentioned in your earlier responses as well, the, the landmark, you know, uh, report that the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, prepared and tabled. Unfortunately, uh, much as uh, many countries tried really hard to have a discussion on this at the Human Rights Council, the Chinese government succeeded in, in, in preventing that from, you know, from uh, uh, stopping that from happening. So what I wanted to really ask you, Dokun, is I know you and other Uyghur leaders, uh, you, you travel a lot, you're meeting a lot of uh, government officials, high government officials, legislators, <clears throat> policy makers, and, and, and other key people. So when you meet with these people in your meetings, like uh, what are you really asking for? And, and some of the, the increased attention and uh, awareness that uh, you all are receiving and have uh, succeeded in creating, has this really translated into real meaningful support for, for you and, and, and your cause? Uh, and uh, also, if you could really touch on, you know, what are some of the key challenges that uh, the World Uyghur Congress and, and other Uyghur organizations face? And especially if you could also address the issue of uh, what are some of the steps and efforts you are undertaking to really uh, go beyond and reach reach out to some of the African and Arab countries, you know, which traditionally have all the supported Beijing's uh, position. So if you could, yeah, if you could comment on, on one or more of those uh, uh, issues. Yes, thank you. One thing I would like to uh, correct this, uh, you know, is the concentration camp is the, the number is uh, 1.8 million. This is the very old number. It is 2018, 2019. Uh, since then, so many uh, uh, and the expert report was published, camp survivors, and there was releasing and, uh, and also give evidence. So it is we estimate this number of the concentration camp and at least three million. Some people there's four million, but we, we estimate at least three million, even in the past <coughs> and the 2019 saying the eight million. So yeah, so we continue doing uh, this advocacy and what we are asking. So we are asking the UN uh, at the UN level, uh, you know, is a uh, this genocide taking place almost six years since 2016 or 2017, five, six years. And uh, yes, yeah, some country and the uh, special reporter and the expert mechanism and issue statement at the UN level, but so far not single urgent section is taking place in the UN uh, Human Rights Council. This is the big issue. So that's why we asking just two weeks ago, we had a meeting also new high commissioner and his office. Guys, we asking them, this is the 52 section of Human Rights Council and it starts this Monday. And so this is a good time. This report is a bachelor, bachelor just, as I said, just 10, 10, 10 months before she left the uh, issue, but she didn't introduce the report. What is the uh, insight? So your yeah, UNICEF office, new commissioner must be present with the report uh, briefly and UNESCO. Because as you know, is a uh, ASPI report saying is between 2017 to 2020, three years, 8,000 most completely demolished. Another 8,000 most uh, partly destroyed, and also Mazar and the, all the religious uh, uh, science is all destroyed. So UNESCO, uh, to be asking UNESCO urgently investigate case of destruction and of natural and cultural heritage. This we asking them. And also we have uh, uh, recused as the national parliament and the government. So far 10 national parliament recognized Uyghur genocide, but this UN has more than 200 uh, countries. 
among them only to recognize Uyghur genocide because Uyghur tribunal within 18 months collected 100,000 documents, 500 people testimony, then make decision. This Chinese government atrocity against Uyghur genocide and crime organization. That's why this all countries have legal obligation to stop ongoing genocide. That's why we asking the national parliament to adopt the Uyghur. Uyghur, Uyghur, Uyghur. We were really oh, no, 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 no. I, I mean, I'm, I'm about to be a, what do you got? I got like probably two minutes. Oh, sorry. Not for me. Eh? And so, and the government uh, and the parliament, more parliament should be recognized with genocide. And the government and should be, uh, I already tell a bit, is uh, take concrete action. Sanction, you know, not in the first level. Is globally, uh, globally 25% pixel cotton coming from the Uyghur first level. So it's China 85% cotton. So, but still is a German company, some US company, Western company continue make business with China. So it is not a business, uh, it's a correct time business as usual. That's why stop ban. US already adopted the uh, uh, Uyghur First Labor Prevention Act. We asking some other countries, some other parliamentary also adopt the same uh, uh, bill, the same, 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 and doing same, same sanction. This is the also very good. Uh, yeah, and the challenge for the world, of course, we have uh, faced a lot of challenge. China misinformation and disinformation campaign very actively. Sometimes it's success, but China spent a lot of money, a lot of energy, use all engine, and trying to stop all. I particularly, I was kicked also from the UN, 2017, 2018, time to time, China is, and I was detained so many country borders so far. You know, despite the China, uh, German citizen. So China and the transnational repression is very strong. China misused international institution. Interpol, United Nations, trying to manipulate it, all international body. So this is the also a directly impact to us. And sec security uh, uh, threats of family members suffering a lot. All Uyghur family and the hostage in the, in the homeland, in the Turkestan. Uh, yeah, China used all economic and the, and the diplomatic uh, uh, and the capacity to try to uh, uh, stop or war. And this is and the support for the issue of global social Muslim world. Unfortunately, it's a shameless, you know. So as we see, is uh, last uh, the October 50 country made joint statement among them only two Muslim country. Uh, most of them Muslim country uh, is a silent. Uh, uh, some of them all this very openly, for example, in Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and the majority of Egypt, this all support Chinese policy against the world. Despite China and the Islam is ideological illness, it must be eradicated. This is the official slogan of the CCP Chinese government. But despite all, all Muslim country, unfortunately, with, uh, with China, but we have to continue doing our work. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dokun. Uh, so, Anna, this this March, you know, we will mark uh, four years since the historic uh, Hong Kong pro democracy protests in 2019. So, obviously, so much has happened since then, including the introduction of uh, the sweeping national security law in 2020, uh, the arrest of a large number of pro democracy leaders and activists in 2021 and the flight of so many democracy leaders, uh, youths and other Hong Kong people into exile. So given all this, uh, can you, uh, you know, like just very, uh, uh, just touch on the key things in terms of, you know, what, what is the current situation in Hong Kong? Uh, what are the lessons from Hong Kong's uh, fight for democracy? And how are groups like the Hong Kong Democracy Council and others that are based outside Hong Kong, how are you able to sustain uh, the fight for democracy and greater freedom in Hong Kong? Yes, yeah, so currently Hong Kong has more than uh, 1,300 political prisoners and uh, that is that was unimaginable, I think, just three or four years ago. And uh, while Hong Kong government is still actively persecuting, you know, for example, the pro-democracy uh, activists and politicians and also a lot of anonymous uh, protesters, um, they are doing it kind of quietly and silently behind the scene, also because we don't really have any uh, media outlets in Hong Kong that can report on it fairly and squarely anymore. And while that is all happening, the Hong Kong government has been extremely active in uh, propagating a lot of propaganda and inviting the international community to continue doing business in Hong Kong. So for example, the Hong Kong government uh, has launched this Hello Hong Kong campaign uh, to invite uh, global uh, uh, financial institutes 
foods and banks, for example, Amcham, uh, to, you know, really stay the alternative story for Hong Kong. So right now, what I would describe is that there is an information war happening and there is a war between narratives, the narrative between the Hong Kong government and an authentic, the narrative of the authentic Hong Kong story from people like ourselves, uh, people in jail, people uh, who have been exiled and people who have been affected uh, by the persecution that have been going on. So right now, really, we are at the beginning stage of a movement in exile. And that is definitely a lot of things that we have to learn from, you know, the Uyghurs, Tibetans and uh, other many communities. And uh, outside of Hong Kong, uh, a lot of our organizations have uh, started, I think, in the past two years uh, to incentivize new ways uh, to continue to struggle that mostly people are trying to focus on first uh, creating uh, positive policy changes and momentum in the US, you know, in the UN and a lot of uh, governments around the world and congresses around the world. And secondly, because we don't have media outlets in Hong Kong anymore that can really report on a lot of things. For example, uh, Epo Daily and Star News have been shut down. So a lot of Hong Kong groups are also trying to conduct more and more researches uh, to really fill that gap. So for example, HADC has been publishing researches on political prisoners or how businesses are behaving in Hong Kong or even how the Hong Kong government has been using technology to uh, surveil on people. So these are some you know, more technical or hard things that we're focusing on. But on the other hand, Hong Kongers are also trying to keep our culture and identity alive by doing film screenings, uh, by having cultural events to tell people we are Hong Kongers and Hong Kongers exist, even though the pro-democracy protests are no longer happening. So, um, and also the last thing I think is that Hong Kongers are also trying to build an economic structure and infrastructure overseas to continue some sort of economic uh, resilience for the Hong Kong movement and for the Hong Kong uh, organizations. So these are some different things that uh, the Hong Kong uh, uh, organizations are doing. But right now I think the struggle is whether we want to or how to overcome you know, the difficulty of coordinating uh, across the world and also link, uh, keeping that linkage with people on the ground inside of Hong Kong. And that is certainly something that I would have to learn from, you know, the Tibetan and Uyghur communities as well, because that is something, you know, we have been discussing. Um, but right now, for example, HADC is advocating for the humanitarian pathways for Hong Kongers to come to the U.S. and especially those, uh, 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 you know, who have been politically persecuted. And also we're trying to debunk uh, the myths that the Hong Kong government is saying through perpetuating through the HAETOs and to uh, uh, impose more and more sanctions on people, uh, on the officials in Hong Kong. But we can come to that later. Thank you, Anna. And uh, before I move forward with my next question for Gombola, I would like to apologize, Chad. I think I'm still uh, picturing uh, Bob in the plane in my mind. So anyways, okay, so uh, Gombola, earlier this uh, January, both houses of the 118th uh, US Congress introduced a legislation called Promoting a Resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act, uh, which promotes dialogue between the PRC and the Dalai Lama towards a peaceful resolution of the conflict between the Tibet and the PRC. So what are the prospects for dialogue given that there has been a no official uh, dialogue since uh, 2010? Uh, Gumbala, as the president or the head of Tibetan Youth Congress, which is an organization that advocates for complete independence of Tibet, what are some of the current activities of the TYC that aims at achieving the goal of complete independence? Uh, which of TYC's campaigns or advocacies has had the greatest impact? And what role do you see for TYC in mobilizing Tibetan youth and keeping them committed to the cause? Thank you. So we, the Tibetan people, are indebted with the United States constant support, uh, whether it be it the honoring a congressional gold medal to His Holiness Dalai Lama, and it's a Tibet Policy and Support Act of uh, 2020. The recent bipartisan bicameral legislation to strengthen the U.S. support on the uh, Tibet Just Cause. So this legislation strengthened uh, the basis of U.S. support for the dialogue by making it U.S. policy that the we, the Tibetan people, are the people who are entitled to right of self-determination under the international law. 
and the legal status of Tibet remain to be determined in accordance with international law. So Tibetan Youth Congress, we call for the Tibet independence. So with the Central Executive Committee and all our regional chapters in North America and in all the uh, freedom loving country, we are organizing a different political movement. We are at doing the, all the advocacy work to call to make the call for of, uh, Tibet independence. So as I mentioned, we are indebted with the United Nations constant support, but we are expecting more. So we want United Nations to officially stand for the TYC and Tibetan call for the complete independence of Tibet. Thank you. Is, uh, oh, Chad, you're back with us, okay. Uh, so Chad, I wanted to take you to a, a related but a slightly different topic. Uh, so as you know, the, the Vatican uh, does not have a diplomatic relations with the PRC, uh, and, but there was an agreement signed in 2018 on the appointment of uh, bishops in China. Uh, so the deal, which has been extended twice, uh, first in 2020 and then again in 2022, is reportedly quite unpopular uh, amongst many in the Vatican, uh, mainly because uh, it, it, in, it in, entails uh, sharing the right of uh, the appointment of bishops, you know, which is uh, such a key responsibility, uh, which normally is uh, really within the, the right and jurisdiction of the, the Vatican. But in, in this case, they have to share it with the CCP. So I'm just wondering if you can just uh, share your thoughts on how does Xi Jinping and the CCP view the Vatican and its role? Uh, what's the current relations between the two sides like? And do you think the Chinese government uh, will really honor the agreement that they have uh, signed regarding the appointment of bishops in China? You know, as we study this, uh, we don't see a reason to believe that the CCP has any intention of truly adhering to the agreement. Uh, they've already broken it once. Uh, not allowing the Vatican to approve of just certain bishops, you know, in December of 2022. Suffice to say, things are tense between the Vatican and Xi Jinping. And it's clear uh, that the CCP has more control and power. Uh, and I think the, a lot of the frustration is obviously the Vatican can't make the decisions without contacting the CCP. So creating that relationship of freedom of religion, that creates conflict. When you have a bishop that's been arrested and it's still incarcerated, you have... 10 priests that have been arrested. You have seminary students that were basically raided and incarcerated. This causes tension between the, uh, the Vatican and Xi Jinping. So we don't see any, any reason that this uh, would, would improve, especially as Xi Jinping takes his third power and his, his third term, and he's really seeking power in this. And so we just don't see much of an improvement going forward right now. Okay, uh, Dalkun, the Uyghurs and Turkic Muslim population in China is estimated to be around uh, 12 million, and another 1.5 million or so reside outside with major concentration in uh, Turkey, Kazakhstan, Pakistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan. Uh, can you briefly describe the structure of World Uyghur Congress and how its leaders and management are selected? Uh, can the experience of the Tibetan community in exile and the central Tibetan administration be helpful in terms of uh, uh, democracy, governance, and uh, leadership model? Sure. Uh, first, uh, one thing is I would like to make correction. And uh, yeah, Chinese government since population was over 12 and a half million, but we believe is around 20 million in East Turkestan uh, and in the exile one and a half million. Yeah, World Uyghur Congress is a uh, structure is the uh, World Democratic Organization. Uh, this, uh, we have 207 delegate. Uh, this 207 delegate elected by Uyghur community, more than 20 country. Last general assembly was taking place uh, November, 2021. Every three years we have a general assembly. So every general assembly elected new leadership of World Uyghur Congress. So uh, we have a huge executive committee, central executive committee, uh, more than uh, 33 uh, executive committee member from 15 country. So head office is Munich, uh, but we have uh, five regional office, London, Brussels, and uh, Berlin. 
uh, and Istanbul uh, be, before the uh, uh, shortly before the pandemic, we opened the offices in Washington DC. But pandemic is coming, then we close it. We we, we reopen them soon. Uh, and the, the, the this is 2007 delegate and uh, elected leadership and the during the general assembly. Uh, uh, World Youth Congress uh, under umbrella have 44 uh, affiliate organization from uh, 20 country. So this uh, all uh, the process is very democratic. Of course, some uh, for the, so your question last part is yes, we got some experience with Tibetan Central uh, Administration uh, before before the old delegation to the World Youth Congress General Assembly uh, sent by the organization. Organization is a selected delegation to join and the General Assembly, they were elected and the World Youth Congress leadership. But we uh, did this reform after we learned, get experience with Tibet Central Administration. Then 2021, for the General Assembly, we start four or five months before the election. Then the all Uyghurs community elected, uh, elected uh, in the delegation. Uh, then and this delegation elected and the new leadership. This is the uh, structure and the, of course we have to a lot of things continue learning uh, by the Tibet Central Administration for because uh, you have a long history, long way on this. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Dolkin. So glad to know that. And uh, Anna. Uh, Hong Kong authorities recently began the trial of uh, 47 pro-democracy figures. Uh, this group includes prominent uh, pro-democracy activists such as uh, Joshua Wang, Benny Tai, and elected lawmakers and elected district officials. So what are your views on the trial and how can the international community and foreign governments help and secure the release of all the political prisoners in Hong Kong? Of course, uh, the US and EU have imposed sanctions on Hong Kong, but have these had an impact? Uh, what do you think can be done more on this regard? Yeah, so uh, thanks for bringing the attention to the NSL 47 cases that have been happening in Hong Kong. So definitely those trials are a fraud, to say the least, um, because right now Hong Kong really has no judiciary independence and that all the judges, uh, the national security law judges and all the prosecutors are heavily pro-Beijing. They would even say things uh, that are clearly political uh, and biased uh, in courts uh, just to prosecute these pro-democracy activists. And there are absolutely nothing wrong with what they have done for the elections. Uh, yet the uh, lawmakers, uh, the, the judges, uh, who uh, are really saying that national security law is about everything in Hong Kong. Um, as for what the international community can do, definitely I would say uh, I'm calling for the release of all political prisoners and I urge governments around the world to call for the same demand. And uh, I really appreciate uh, the Council General in Hong Kong Hong Kong, Greg May, who has said that previously when he was attending a panel as well, he called for the release of all political prisoners while he was sitting in the U.S. consulate inside of Hong Kong. So that was a great action, great move uh, from the U.S. government side. Um, but as for sanctions, of course, there have been a bills passed before uh, that would allow the U.S. government to sanction, uh, to sanction Hong Kong officials. And that includes, for example, the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, and even previous executive orders allow U.S. officials uh, to sanction uh, Hong Konger officials and judges. But uh, right now, only a few dozen of uh, Hong Kong higher up officials have been sanctioned. So for example, John Lee, the chief executive of Hong Kong, and Carrie Lam, the previous chief executive uh, of Hong Kong, are sanctioned. Um, but I think this really is not the most effective way of doing it because these people, by virtue of stepping up to the position they are in right now, they are already prepared for these sanctions. So they have already done everything to minimize it harm or damage that can be done to them uh, personally. And also sanctions uh, in this globalized economy right now, I think sanctions are really only useful when it's done multilaterally. So that means when the US tries to impose a sanction on official, uh, it should be echoed by the UK government, the EU government, uh, the EU as well, 
to really make it effective. So I really urge uh, the governments around the world to work together when they're trying to use sanction as an imperative. And right now, um, per uh, the CCC uh, in Congress have released a recommendation letter before uh, for the President Biden to sanction both the NSL national security law judges and persecutors in Hong Kong, because right now they are the ones that decide the sentence of these political prisoners. And uh, they should be the ones that are targeted because they are the ones who have more to lose uh, than the higher officials, I would argue. So right now, I'm also calling for the sanctions of more NSL judges and persecutors per CCC suggestions. And that is also in line with what the Hong Kong community has been asking for. So in short, I would say sanctions have not been the most effective right now but it could be very effective if it's done right. And I think that's the case for a lot of our communities as well. So I really urge the US government and governments around the world to really fully explore the possibility and uh, the limitless possibility of sanctions and possibly a really uh, a kind of copy or reference after the sanctions they have imposed on Russia uh, and do it to the same extent to China. Thank you, Anna. Thank, thanks, Anna. So my final question uh, from my side is to you, Gombala. Uh, so as you very well know, uh, one of the most important issues that uh, is in the minds of uh, not just Tibetans, but also the Chinese government and, and many who support Tibet and the Tibetan issue is the issue around succession and uh, uh, you know, what happens, you know, who comes, uh, will there be a uh, 15th Dalai Lama, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, so uh, I was wondering if you could just share some of your thoughts on how do you think the Chinese government is preparing in terms of, uh, we all know that that they're gonna jump in and really try to co-opt and control this process. Uh, and uh, what are some of the scenarios that uh, you think uh, we can envision in terms of if and when uh, the Chinese government does pick uh, an illegitimate you know, successor to the 14 Dalai Lama. And what can we, both uh, Tibetans as well as everyone who really supports uh, the, the rights of the Tibetan people to freely practice uh, kind of their religious traditions and select their own spiritual leaders, what can, uh, what can you know, this group do in order to really shape the outcome and, uh, and kind of uh, prepare for you know, what lies ahead? Yes, uh, CCP interfering with the Tibetan belief and faith for their political gain is not a new. So they are doing it, of, they are practicing it for a very long uh, time for the China, their own political gain. For last six decades, they destroyed Tibetan monastery and the learning institution in the name of modernization and effort to brainwash the Tibetan with the socialist propaganda, but they are not successful in their mission. Especially the Tibetan inside Tibet have more or the stronger respect and reverence and belief to the His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So this proof that the Chinese, is, uh, Chinese uh, the CCP failed uh, in their mission to brainwash, in their mission to interfere in Tibetan uh, belief and the faith. So TYC, we strongly condemn and reject the Chinese order number five from year 2007. So on annual basis, we organize different campaign. We are organized advocacy work to challenge the Chinese order number five, and we condemn their state kind of uh, interference in the reincarnation of Lama. So the order number five in 2007 mentioned that all the reincarnate Lama must be approved by the Chinese government through their PRC State and Religious Affairs Bureau. However, the China should understand that the reincarnation system is a century old tradition and that is de deeply indebted in the Tibetan people's culture. The, so the Chinese decade old policy cannot replace uh, this tradition. So Tibetan Youth Congress, we. Uh, recently, in year 2022, we convinced a two days conference under the title uh, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama Institution, uh, 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 its uh, relevance and the significance, where all the experts and where all our participants, uh, during that meeting, we have uh, 200 participants from the 45 different regional chapters across the globe. 
So with the same voice, first thing, we pray for His Holiness to long live. And second one is that we condemn the China to trying to interfere in the uh, His Holiness uh, reincarnation and the process of uh, yeah, His Holiness succession. So meanwhile, we are very thankful for the United States for officially supporting uh, His Holiness reincarnation and accepting uh, the one which will be accepted by His Holiness himself and by the uh, office of His Holiness Dalai Lama and uh, majorly accepted by the Tibetan people. So I want to uh, convey this message to the Chinese Communist government that they have a practical uh, experience of a, a pension lama. So the Tibetan people inside and across the globe uh, respect and uh, follow the one real pension lama, which is a, appointed by the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. There is a one rubber stamp appointed by the CCP, which the CCP over and again forcefully tried uh, tried to get, uh, tried to influence him, tried to welcome him by the Tibetan masses, but they are not success in advocating, but they are not success in branding. Uh, the stand, uh, the, the their own kind of pension lama. So with that, that experience, that proof that the Tibetan people and the world at large will uh, consider, will respect the one which is appointed, but the one which is accepted by His Holiness Dalai Lama himself, the 14th Dalai Lama himself, and the Tibetan people. Thank you. Thank you, Pambula. Okay, so um, I see that we have already exceeded our time limits, so we will not be taking any more questions. And uh, I would like to thank all our speakers for making today's discussion a very productive one. Um, it is um, indeed very nice to see all the speakers representing different organizations, the four major organizations come together on one screen. And I really hope and uh, and I really look forward to um, working together as one strong entity and becoming one strong voice. Thank you so much. And I would also like to thank everyone who is involved for today's event, handling all the te technical aspects of the discussion in the background. And thank you to our lovely live audience. And before I end, I would also like to say that the video of this session will be uploaded on AFI website at uh, www.asiafreedominstitute.org. And please follow AFI's Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn pages for more information on AFI programs and activities. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.